January 25, 1969, marked a bustling day in Boston, Massachusetts. The atmosphere was electric as sports fans eagerly poured into the Boston Garden to witness the Celtics face off against their arch rivals, the Philadelphia team. The following night promised another wave of excitement, as throngs of supporters prepared to rally behind the ascending Bruins of the NHL. Meanwhile, just a short distance away, the legendary rock band Led Zeppelin took the stage at the Boston Tea Party, captivating audiences with a mesmerizing four-hour set as part of their inaugural North American tour, which would later be hailed as one of their finest performances. Despite the city grappling with profound urban challenges such as decay, renewal projects, and racial tensions, Boston's status as a cultural and entertainment hub remained undeniable. The People Before Highways Day protest on January 25, 1969, symbolized the mounting frustration towards Boston's transportation network. Concerns escalated with the Interstate Act of 1956 and the subsequent traumatic division caused by IR-93 through the heart of the city. The arrival of a new governor heightened fears among Bostonians and metropolitan area residents regarding the extent of highway expansion plans. Despite the push from highway-focused urban planners for additional expressways, a diverse coalition of stakeholders, including residents, activists, and academics, recognized the potential devastation these projects could inflict on communities and rallied against them. In a remarkable turn of events, Governor Francis Sargent responded to the protest by declaring a moratorium on highway construction in 1972. Subsequently, an outright freeze on highway construction within Route 128 was announced. This shift in focus towards mass transit, particularly subways and commuter rails, signaled a victory for grassroots activism and set the stage for the Massachusetts Bay Transportation Authority MBTA, to emerge as a pivotal player in shaping Boston's transportation landscape. Despite initial optimism, the promise of the MBTA faltered, marred by safety concerns highlighted by federal regulators. Tragic accidents, such as the 2008 crash on the Green Line, underscored the urgent need for reforms within the aging transit infrastructure, casting a shadow over the once promising vision of Boston's subway system. A congestion of westbound traffic led to a standstill between Government Center and Boylston, setting the stage for a collision between two trains. Train 3808 obeyed cautionary signals, coming to a halt, while train 3612 failed to do so, resulting in a collision at approximately 40 km per hour. The impact left 68 individuals injured, prompting federal investigators to scrutinize the incident. Upon examination of train brakes, signal lights, and visibility within underground tunnels, it was determined that the operator's distraction, specifically by attempting to send a text, led to the missed warnings, highlighting both operator error and systemic flaws within the transit network. Structural deficiencies within the MBTA's infrastructure were underscored by a series of incidents, including multiple derailments on the Orange Line near the Wellington stop from 2019 to 2020. A tragic accident in 2022, where a passenger was fatally dragged by a malfunctioning red line train due to a short circuit, prompted a comprehensive 90-page report. The report revealed alarming statistics, indicating that MBTA-related incidents far exceeded national averages, with Boston Rails accounting for a staggering 94% of all light rail injuries nationwide from 2017 to 2021. Beyond safety concerns, the MBTA faces operational challenges, with widespread slowdowns and closures plaguing the subway system. Over the years, average speeds on the orange, red, and blue lines have declined, exacerbated by a network design that originates from the downtown core and extends outward. The radial network design, while common among American subway systems, poses logistical hurdles for maintenance, expansion, and accessibility. Despite efforts to address these issues, the MBTA shortcomings continue to impact commuters' daily lives, influencing their mode of transportation and shaping perceptions of the city's transit infrastructure. The commuter rail system in Boston, resembling its subway in many ways but on a larger scale, predominantly caters to downtown commuters. This setup efficiently serves individuals commuting from the outskirts to downtown destinations, but its effectiveness diminishes when commuters have multiple stops in their daily routines. For instance, a resident of Winter Hill working in downtown Boston enjoys a swift 18-minute subway commute, but adding a third stop, such as attending a recreational activity in Cambridge after work, significantly complicates the journey. 
In practice, wealthier commuters opt for cars in such scenarios, leaving radial networks to serve primarily low-income commuters with limited alternatives. American subway systems, including Boston's, have essentially evolved into miniaturized commuter rail networks, primarily catering to lower-income demographics residing between downtown areas and affluent suburbs. Unlike systems in cities like Paris, which boast less radial designs facilitating efficient routes between various urban destinations, American systems struggle with logistical challenges during shutdowns or maintenance work. Boston Subway, for example, faces significant disruptions during closures, disproportionately impacting downtown commuter demographics and further limiting its ridership demographic to primarily low-income individuals lacking alternative transportation options. The solution lies in implementing ring routes, which improve resiliency, expand service beyond downtown commuters, and divert traffic away from congested core areas. While Boston has ring roads in its highway system, similar concepts on the transit level remain underdeveloped. Other cities, such as Washington DC and New York City, are actively addressing this design flaw by constructing light rail lines and planning interborough express routes to better connect underserved communities to transit networks. However, the MBTA's current fragile design and commuter-focused approach pose challenges, exacerbated by shifts in commuter behavior and financial strain aggravated by the COVID-19 pandemic. Now facing a drastic decline in ridership, with fair revenue covering a mere 19% of its expenses, the MBTA finds itself in an existential crisis. Decades of deferred maintenance, chronic staffing shortages, and accumulating debt have compounded the agency's financial woes. A significant portion of its annual costs, around 20%, to be precise, is attributed to servicing this debt, with half of that amount allocated solely to interest payments. Despite this bleak financial picture, not all aspects of the MBTA are equally troubled, with the commuter rail network emerging as a relative bright spot amidst the turmoil. Unlike the subway system, which primarily caters to lower-income demographics, the commuter rail primarily serves affluent suburban residents commuting to downtown Boston for corporate jobs. Consequently, only 22% of commuter rail riders come from households earning less than $56,000 annually, compared to 36% to 43% on the subway lines. This demographic disparity underscores a fundamental challenge faced by transit systems globally. While lower-income individuals heavily rely on them, higher-income passengers often have alternative transportation options. The disparity between the commuter rail and subway systems not only highlights economic inequalities, but also raises questions about the MBTA's governance. The agency's board of directors, appointed by the state governor, reflects this discrepancy in focus. With four of the seven board seats held by individuals with direct ties to communities serviced by the commuter rail, there is a disproportionate emphasis on commuter rail concerns. This skewed focus further exacerbates the challenges faced by the subway system, perpetuating economic divides and hindering efforts to create a more equitable transit system. Vice Chair Thomas Koch holds the position of mayor in Quincy, a town served by both the commuter rail and subway systems. Quincy is likely more dependent on the commuter rail, given its quicker access to downtown destinations compared to the subway. Thomas McGee and Charlie Sisitsky, mayors of Lynn and Framingham respectively, represent towns exclusively serviced by the commuter rail. While it's challenging to provide concrete evidence of a disproportionate focus on the commuter rail, the composition of the board and the current state of the system suggest otherwise. The underlying reasons for the MBTA's dysfunctionality are not groundbreaking, but are outlined in the Federal Transit Administration's comprehensive 90-page report on its operational shortcomings. Running an effective subway system is achievable, as demonstrated by cities worldwide, irrespective of their geographical, climatic, or economic characteristics. The MBTA's dire financial situation, exacerbated by the depletion of its COVID-induced federal stimulus, underscores the need for sustainable solutions. While physical issues can be addressed with sufficient resources, the cultural approach to transportation in American cities presents a more significant challenge. Unlike New York City, where the transit system caters to a diverse range of needs beyond just commuters, most American rapid transit systems focus primarily on serving commuters, neglecting other demographics. Transforming the fundamental design of these systems is a formidable task, but is essential for improving American transit. 
Investing in service improvements to initiate a virtuous cycle of success should be prioritized over perpetuating the vicious cycle of failures. Have you ever been into an American train or subway? How was that experience? Share it with us in the comment section below.